Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Support Center for Data Sharing's webinar on modular license for APIs. Today we have uh, two speakers, um, Hans and Zenzi, who are also ready in the call. For I will not spend too much time um, going over what SCDS is. It's essentially an EU initiative that aims to promote awareness on what data sharing is across Europe. And one of the aspects of the focus is, is also on the legal side, hence um, our work and our research into modelized for APIs and the purpose of this webinar. For your information, I will be recording this webinar so that those who have missed it can still see it on YouTube and once it is published later this week or early next week. And with that, I happily give the floor to Hans to begin. Thank you. So good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, maybe just a quick introduction. Um, so my name is Hans Schoendiet. I'm part of uh, Timelex, a uh, law firm established in Brussels, uh, specializes in IT law and IC policy, ICT policy issues. Um, we are one of the uh, partners supporting uh, Capgemini and the um, Support Center for Data Sharing European Initiative to um, facilitate data sharing in a variety of uh, sectors, business context, uh, and so forth. We look particularly at the legal side of things. Um, so uh, looking into potential challenges, barriers for sharing data across companies, across organizations, across sectors and contexts even, um, but also at providing some of the um, solutions on how you can make it a little bit easier. So um, those of you who might have looked at the website already will have seen that we've produced some uh, reports, some overviews on uh, common licensing terms, licensing agreements that are frequently encountered in practice. Um, in addition to an overview of European legislation, European level uh, legal texts that um, mandate or prohibit data sharing or that impose certain requirements and certain constraints. So that's a sort of a, a baseline uh, of knowledge that can help people determine uh, what they can do with their data, how they might use it in practice. The session we have scheduled for this afternoon is um, a little bit more specific, a little bit more exact than that. Um, it's specifically about uh, making data available, sharing data with other parties um, through uh, APIs. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing that, other than the fact, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later on, um, other than the fact that it's catching on more and more and that it's become uh, more and more popular and more and more necessary to make data available via APIs, one of the reasons that we're also doing that is we're working within this project, within the support center, on a support tool, um, basically a, a tool that will help you compile, create your own uh, licenses for data sharing. So we want to give you a bit of a preview of how that will work, what that will look like. Um, first of all, as a bit of a teaser to all of you to let you know uh, what's up and coming and what you will be able to use um, relatively quickly now, and uh, in fact, by the end of the month already, but also to give you the opportunity of providing feedback and suggestions and maybe raise some questions um, about uh, how you see this topic, what you see as the legal challenges for uh, data sharing uh, through uh, APIs. As a purely practical point, um, I do have the uh, chat window open at the side of the screen. So any uh, questions that you type during the uh, chat, I will try to pick up on immediately. But separately from that, as you'll see in a moment, there is a uh, Q&A session um, scheduled at uh, the end of the presentation. So we'll have the opportunity to raise uh, questions. So uh, agenda-wise, what we wanted to present and provide to you today is first of all to have a presentation on um, data sharing in general and why specifically data sharing uh, via APIs is on the uh, policy agenda nowadays, why it's being encouraged from a policy perspective and in some cases even made legally mandatory. And then secondly, looking at the legal challenges, legal complexities, when uh, making data available uh, to end user th users through APIs or from the other perspective, if you're a user looking to extract data from an API or obtain data from an API, what are the issues that you might want to be um, careful about? So that's sort of a, a um, knowledge sharing um, overview where we'll also look at some um, practical cases uh, on uh, for data sharing and, and what the, the legal challenges there are. And then the second part of the session is to um, explain a little bit what the support center is doing there, what the European Commission is doing um, to make life a little bit easier and to facilitate data sharing uh, through APIs and particularly our support center API uh, licensing assistance. 
there's a session scheduled at the end for about 20 minutes, so hopefully depending on how quickly the presentation goes, for uh, questions and answers where you can raise any comments or uh, present any observations, any concerns, any questions that you might have, where we'll do our best uh, to um, help you forward with that. Okay. First of all, maybe then, um, as I noted, uh, a quick introduction on uh, why this is important, why we are working on data sharing in general and data sharing via APIs uh, specifically, and what the uh, legal problems there are. Um, so first of all, maybe just a quick um, overview, a quick perspective on what it is that we're focusing on, uh, what we actually what we mean by data sharing. Um, it's important to emphasize that we look at it more broadly than just um, getting data from A to B, the, the, the technical modalities behind it, the, oper the operational procedural requirements, or even the legal constraints. We take a very practice-oriented view with this project, looking generally at um, any kind of transactions, any kind of methodologies, any kind of um, complexities and possibilities that can present themselves when making um, digital information available between different organizations, which can be from the same industry, com comparable industry, can be competitors, uh, can be teams, they can be operating within uh, the same uh, vertical or they can um, operate between a, in a specific sector. We take a very broad view of that. What is particularly important to emphasize is that data sharing in this context of this project is a lot broader than um, the open data movement and certainly also than um, the uh, topic of reusing public sector information. This is an important one because um, as you'll be aware, uh, the European Commission uh, published its European data strategy a couple of months ago in, uh, in February, um, which takes a very uh, no, it takes a much broader perspective on um, what data sharing is, why it's important, and what we should achieve there. Um, if you look at the sort of the historical background, the historical context, a lot of the focus has been on um, opening up public sector information, information held by the government, basically, making that available for reuse um, to uh, the private sector. Um, that's historically been the context. There's been sort of more of a philosophical movement that's grown out of that, emphasizing that um, data should be available without constraints, that uh, certainly the government should make as much data and preferably all data available for reuse as freely as possible. Um, and uh, that's, um, that perspective has uh, broadened a little bit over the last couple of months and years. If you look at the European data strategy in, uh, that was uh, released by the European Commission, the perspective there is a lot um, broader now. It's not just about um, making data flow from the public sector to uh, other reusers, but also um, more broadly to look at how data flows within um, society itself, creating a single unified European uh, data market. A lot of other topics are relevant there other than the public sector information angle, the open data movement. That also looks, for instance, at cases where it might make sense to at least encourage or in some cases require um, private industries, companies to make data available uh, to the governments, to public administrations, for instance, because the creation of that data has been publicly funded. Uh, that's been a movement that's been ongoing for quite a long time making sure that, um, for instance, scientific research, which is funded through the taxpayer money, is made available, again, certainly also to the, uh, the government, to public administrations, but also more broadly to um, other scientific researchers, or why not, society as a whole, so that people can build on uh, the knowledge that has been um, generated through public funding. Probably in, in current, you know, corona, COVID-19 times, I don't have to emphasize the importance of um, sharing research uh, outcomes, for instance, indeed in the medical uh, sector and pharmaceutical industry, to make sure that um, needless duplication of efforts is avoided um, as much as possible. But it doesn't even end there. It's not just about um, sharing data from government to companies and from companies back to government, but it's also about looking at how um, the... I think, um, accidentally, yeah, I got your own piece of meat. Sorry. Oh, I'll give you part of mine. <laughs> Incidentally, can people who are not talking perhaps mute um, and please enjoy the meat. Um, so uh, 
Yes, so the European data strategy has broadened uh, a little bit over uh, the past couple of months, also to uh, reflect the more um, diversified um, ecosystem, um, the broader reality that we are all data consumers, but also data producers, data generators. One of the other topics that's being looked into is um, data donations, data altruism, so encouraging um, citizens and individuals to make their own data available um, for reuse. Uh, generally, the perspective has broadened to looking at cases where, um, in any situation where data sharing can benefit society as a whole, um, possibly in the traditional sense of public benefit, for instance, getting better health care or getting more um, efficient traffic management, which are all very recognizable cases, but also increasing competition. For instance, uh, we'll go back to it later on and financial services, making sure that data can be made available uh, through, from uh, banks to more um, uh, startup innovative uh, fintech uh, financial technology companies but also uh, encouraging um, citizen science, even all of those cases where uh, data flows can create a benefit either for society in general or for economic growth or for individual citizens. The goal is very much to look at win-win conditions. Focus isn't necessarily on making sure that all data is made available to everybody without constraints, but on creating a framework that is conducive uh, to sharing data in order to create benefits for uh, the European economic economy and for European society. So data sharing as a whole uh, has become uh, a lot more popular. Where do APIs come into that? Because this is a session not on data sharing in general, but specifically on data sharing via APIs. Well, first of all, there's the underlying trends. If you look at how the data economy has evolved in uh, a couple of years, everybody knows, uh, has noticed obviously that much more data is being collected and generated all the time. Um, the quality of data is improving simply because of the speed with which it can be um, collected, validated, uh, and exchanged, which allows you to work um, with much more current data. Um, many simple applications of that. If you use your favorite navigation app, undoubtedly gives you real-time information on uh, traffic flows. It can do that quite simply because, of the, because they can rely on uh, mobile phone signals to determine traffic flows. It's one of the tools, there are many other data sources, but it's one example where the um, gigantic quantity of data that can be collected nowadays and the ease with which it can be reused can give you much more insights, uh, much more readily, because that's the kind of service that nobody even pays for anymore. We take that all for granted as something that's just there for us. That's just how society works. Data has become more affordable. It's easier to store, easier to process, easier to, easier to transfer it. Um, we all are aware of how uh, information society has, an, has evolved, where uh, processes like storage of data and exchange of data have become commoditized. It's cheap to get, and the more you need to move, the cheaper it gets. So it's a lot easier to, uh, to build uh, data services. And finally, and this is what I was talking about earlier on, there's really a, been a cultural change, a cultural mindset. Everybody still acknowledges that um, data is extremely valuable and needs to be guarded. Um, the, it's, it's, it's too facile to say that all data must be made available for everybody under, under any circumstance. But we do recognize that um, a lot of legal, a lot of uh, economic value and societal value can be created by um, encouraging openness by uh, encouraging people to make data um, more available. We understand now, and by we I mean uh, policymakers, but I think also society in general, we realize that by um, making data more openly available under appropriate safeguards, obviously, and under specific conditions, we can generate more benefits for ourselves, for society as a whole, um, for the European markets, for the European um, community in general. And we also see that um, policymakers, lawmakers have been more and more willing to uh, intervene in this area and to uh, gradually encourage, or in some cases require, uh, data to be shared, to be made openly available for reuse. Uh, in the PSI context, public sector information, the open data movement I've already mentioned. Financial services is another example of that but also intelligent uh, transportation services, um, smart cities, uh, logistical information. The simple fact that, you know, if you're a European citizen and you need to use public transportation and you cannot get live data on where your train is or where your bus is, 
that's almost offensive nowadays. That is a problem that you feel should be recognized. And that's nothing to laugh about. The fact that that information must be made available, must be openly shared um, by uh, service providers, really creates a lot more efficiency and allows you to um, uh, get a lot more value out of those services and work much more effectively. APIs play a very important role there. Um, traditionally, data sharing was about making data, data sets available that uh, can be downloaded and uh, reused with relative ease, integrated into your own applications. Basically, it was a series of one-off transactions. If you look at um, APIs, APIs, uh, which I've included a, a broad definition here, relatively commonly accepted one, set of functions, definitions, uh, procedures, and protocols that facilitate, that enable machine-to-machine -machine communication, um, seamless exchange of data, basically on requests. It's basically the difference between, and, and I'll, I'll put it in, in non-technical platitude uh, terms, it's a little bit more complicated. It's the difference between downloading an Excel document from uh, a website and uh, being able to make live queries on uh, the exact data that you need at the exact specific period of time and getting the exact data that is available right now. And that part, that dynamic nature of APIs, the fact that you can get um, accurate information of the data that, as it is available right now, is what allows you to build dynamic real-time services that allows you to offer data um, as a service rather than um, just being able to tell people, look, this is what you get right now, come back to me when you need a new data set and we will try to make it um, as, as accurate as we can. So the use of APIs, uh, the use of um, uh, services uh, where uh, companies, but also uh, governments, public services, make data available on a continuous basis as they get it and as accurately as possible, allows you to build a lot more um, innovative services. Just by way of example, and it's it's a real life case that was talking to uh, somebody about it this morning. Um, so it's not something that is integrated in the slides because it's literally just came up this morning. Is uh, an, um, it was, we were contacted by a, a governmental body that's developing an app that allows you basically to uh, track how busy tourist locations are um, for the simple purposes of, you know, uh, COVID-19, corona measures, uh, tourism would like to reopen, but they would like to also give an indication to tourists how busy certain venues are in order to let you know whether it's safe to go there. That means you need to have data on how many people are there at any given period of time. Um, they are working with uh, the owners, the operators of tourist sites to get information as it's reported by them. They're also looking at, into uh, developing an app that um, allows tourists to uh, broadcast their own uh, location and to get information about how many other people are at a tourist site. So that's an, a simple example of a simple app. There's nothing you know, technically staggering happening there, but that requires APIs to share this data on a live basis to make sure that everybody gets um, accurate information about how busy a specific site is at any given point in time. So the innovation that that creates, the fact that you can get live information about the current state of play, really provides a lot of uh, opportunities for innovation in a lot of industries. You mentioned you know, logistics here, healthcare, current pandemic situation. Also environmental data to get live information about uh, pollution in a specific uh, region, in a specific area is very valuable. Meteorological services, what the weather is going to be like, all of that is enabled through APIs. You would not be able to get those kind of um, functionalities uh, without um, access to live information. So that's where APIs come in. It's not easy uh, always to be able to um, integrate data into an application. There are a lot of legal challenges, a lot of legal ins and outs, um, both for data sharing in general, and, uh, specifically for APIs. A lot of those are common because as you can imagine, um, very few problems go away simply because you're using an API. You get a couple of additional challenges, not many problems dissipate or disappear through the use uh, of an API. So I'll give a very quick, short overview of some of the main legal challenges you're likely to encounter. If you'd like more information on, on any of these, uh, I'd recommend the reports that have been produced so far on uh, current uh, data licenses and on legal frameworks, specific, uh, and specifically in Europe in relation to data sharing because they provide more detail on all of these topics. So what are some of the main 
uh, issues that probably you need to look into uh, when uh, sharing data when you want to share your own data or when you want to be want uh, to convince another party to share their data or require them to share uh, their data um, with you uh, I see there undoubtedly are many complicated questions, but in the chat, there's a, a question whether there will be links to these, these additional sources there at the end of the slides, which you will get. So you will see the um, links to these sources later on and you will get them in your mailbox as well. Um, what are some of these challenges? Um, data protection is the most obvious one. Um, as you'll all be aware, we have demanding rules and rightly so. Uh, for personal data in the European Union, uh, information uh, that identifies natural persons or allows you uh, to link information to a specific person. Um, this is one of the bigger challenges uh, in the context of data sharing. Data ge sharing generally means that other people get access to your information and you will probably will not be able to control how uh, they use that data. That creates some tension with data protection law in the European Union because generally speaking, if you have uh, collected data for a specific purpose, it can only be used for that purpose. So a uh, carte blanche approach where you say, here's my data, do with it what you want, that is not possible for uh, personal data. You need to build in some constraints on what a recipient is allowed to do with that data. Whether you're able to enforce it is a different matter, but it starts at least by putting arrangements in place to say what it can be used for. Same thing also for transparency, for data subject rights. Um, people need to be able to find out uh, what is going to happen with their data, and they need to be able to exercise their rights, uh, gain uh, access to the information that you have about them, uh, object to data processing in some contexts. Um, that can be challenging when you want to move data from one spot to a ne the next because you don't know what that next person, you cannot tightly control what that next person is going to be um, doing with it. The application that I mentioned, the tourism application that I mentioned earlier on is an, an, um, an interesting application, an interesting example of that. Um, in principle, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, an app is being installed and people provide their permission or they refuse their permission, free to do that, to share their location um, with the uh, tourism agency. Um, however, then the question came up, well, what can that tourism agency also do with that data? The app is being um, advertised or will be advertised to people as a way of finding out um, how busy a specific location is. If that's how you advertise it, if that is what you're telling people, then that is the only thing you can do with it. Um, so they have been looking into options for uh, creating further, extracting further value from uh, that data, for instance, uh, linking it to spending behavior in certain areas, which would allow you to create a lot of interesting uh, knowledge. That's something that, uh, well, there are ways to do it, but at least from a data protection perspective, requires a second look um, there. That's not something where you can just say, well, now we have the data, now we can do what we want with it, including by combining it with other data sources. That's always going to be challenging. Uh, data quality and data liability are very obvious issues. Um, people sometimes, um, I feel, overestimate that issue in the sense that they feel that if I'm sharing my data, I'm going to be responsible and liable for anything that goes wrong with it. That, of course, is not to say the least, not entirely accurate. You do have the option to say, uh, to provide assurances or to do, uh, disclaim any assurances of quality, of accuracy, of currency of, of your data. You can um, restrict to what extent you are liable and responsible for the accuracy of data. So it is an issue that you can manage. However, it is important then to take a position on that and to address it, to say you know, what kind of assurances, if any, you provide to your data. Intellectual property rights are important. Um, data can be, uh, data collections uh, or individual data items can be protected by copyrights or in the European Union by database rights. Um, that doesn't mean that data sharing is impossible, but obviously before you share your data, before you make it available to a third party, you need to make sure that you have the necessary rights uh, that allow you to, uh, to do that. You don't want to accidentally infringe on other people's rights. Um, specific legislation. Many contexts, there are explicit rules, sector-specific rules or data-specific rules that govern the sharing of data on either what must be done or what can be done. Um, examples uh, include um, our REACH regulation on chemicals, um, clinical trials of specific rules, 
uh, the uh, Payment Services Directive has specific rules on what data must be made available and under which conditions and what can be uh, retained. So it's important to know the context that you are working in and to look at what you are actually allowed to do or even required to do, what kind of constraints you may impose that you may not impose. That is a particularly challenging one for that one in particular. You know, if, if you're interested in finding out some details about your industry, I'd happily refer to the report uh, on uh, European legislation on data sharing that we've produced. Again, the link will come uh, at the end of the presentation. Fair market practices, consumer protection uh, can uh, be an uh, issue as well. Uh, so the manner in which you're sharing data, you're making it available, cannot constitute an unfair business practice, an unfair market practice in the sense that it um, makes it impossible uh, for other people to for other people to compete with you. And same thing for consumer protection, um, you cannot charge individual consumers. Uh, large amounts of money for the services that you provide and then refuse to accept any kind of responsibility or any kind of uh, liability for that whatsoever. So this also touches upon your business model and the market that you're working in. Uh, competition law, very uh, briefly summarized, is also an important topic. Uh, sharing data is important, but especially if you're not making data openly available and sharing it only within a closed community, you do have to make sure that you don't run afoul of anti-competition uh, rules. If you have a dominant market position, either on your own or with the data that you, with the entities that you're sharing uh, data with, you can get into trouble there um, if the sharing practices that you've adopted actually make it possible for competitors to operate in the market. That's um, not a hugely common issue, but one that you do need to be wary of, especially if you represent a large undertaking and you have a very uh, strong market power in a specific industry. Um, and finally, uh, enforcement of the agreement, um, the tiny practical points, um, you know, you can write whatever you want in your terms and conditions for sharing data. The big question is always, what happens if something goes wrong? Can you actually enforce those rules uh, and how? What can you realistically do? Can you make sure that uh, your rights and those of other stakeholders are uh, being um, protected? A uh, question being raised in the chat is whether companies are allowed to make data available and charge for it. Um, as a general rule, yes, they definitely can. Um, so the um, current legal framework that we have doesn't forbid you uh, at all to create a business model behind the sharing of personal data. Um, having said that, that is the general rule. It can be um, shaped to a very large extent by the kind of data that you uh, have available for you. So I, we referenced earlier on already public sector information where we have um, specific directive and specific national laws also on data that must be made available and also on the money that can be charged for it. Without going into too much detail, for electronic data sharing in particular, generally it's very difficult to charge any amount of money for it because public industries, the public sector, are only allowed to charge marginal costs. Um, so uh, basically the um, cost for making a new copy and making that available for reuse, which in an electronic context um, is um, often uh, difficult to uh, justify. Um, the example there that's mentioned also in the chat for on the competition issue is what if you have a, a very dominant uh, market um, player, um, environmental sectors raised here, companies that build data portals and then charge $50,000 a year to participate in the consortium. That's a tricky one to the extent that that data would be needed for competitive purposes. It's, I'm not going to say it's definitely wrong or it's definitely right because um, you have to determine specifically whether, you know, what the market situation is, um, whether that access to that information is necessary to compete in the market and whether you have um, other sources that are available. The general rule, and that's as much as I can say about it right now without making any statements on the particular case, which I don't know here, general rule is if um, data is going to be made available for reuse under financially prohibitive circumstances, that can be troublesome uh, if you have a dominant um, market position or if it's uh, information that has been publicly funded and would fall under um, PSI rules. But it's a very... Um, context specific answer so don't take my answer to read that this particular case assuming that it's not hypothetical is definitely wrong um so that was legal issues for data sharing in general how does the uh, 
the involvement of APIs actually change that. So what if you don't offer your data as um, a one-time transaction, one-time downloads, but if instead you start making data available as a service um, upon request? Um, most of the issues uh, that I mentioned on the previous slide, in fact, all of the issues continue to apply. So uh, sadly, none of those issues goes away or is resolved simply by using an API as your technical and operational means of making data available um, to uh, third parties. There are, however, some other complexities that uh, you may need to look at. Um, for instance, the accessibility of the data, um, formatting issues, the authentication of end users, so whether you uh, impose any kind of particular procedures before they are allowed to access the data, duration and availability, whether you want to um, uh, impose any kind of constraints on uh, or uh, offer any kind of assurances, guarantees, on uptime, availability of response time, throughputs, all of these technical factors that seem non-legal in nature, but which are very important for users to have a guarantee on if that's necessary for their particular um, service. So that's an additional topic that you don't have to worry about, or at least not to the same extent as with uh, one-off data downloads, which does become much more critical here. Essentially, it's the move from being a um, resource provider to becoming a uh, service provider. The whole data as a service issue requires you to think a little bit more about how my service is organized, uh, what kind of assurances I can offer and what I cannot um, offer. For the data itself, looking at the content of the data, actually not much changes. The only thing to look out for is a very um, natural reflex that people have, even though it's incorrect, which is the assumption that if data is made available instantaneously through an API, then somehow the data must be accurate and must be up to date and must be complete. That's not true, of course. It's perfectly possible to have very outdated uh, information made available through an API. But people expect that that's not the case. People expect if they can pull data live from an API, then that must be accurate, up-to-date, and complete information. So this does become a little bit more important from the perspective of expectation management, also for managing your liabilities, that you make it clear whether the data is indeed uh, current, whether it's accurate, whether it's up-to-date, and to what extent, what kind of assurances that you have on that. It is perfectly acceptable, and it's even a standard practice in, in virtually every um, API data license that you look at. It's pretty much standard practice to say, this is the data, the best data that I have available right now, and the only guarantee that I can provide you with is that this is the data that's in my database and that I'm using myself. That's perfectly fine, that's legally valid. Nobody has a grounds to come back to you and say, no, you have to make sure that this is um, completely accurate, completely up to date at all times. However, it is important to make it clear to people whether there is an update cycle or a revision cycle and um, basically what kind of reliance they can play place on the data that you're making available. So that's just important also to manage expectations and to make sure that you are not held responsible or liable, or liable for people's um, unreasonable assumptions basically in, re in relation to your data. There are also some benefits or also some ways uh, that um, where APIs compare quite favorably, other than the functional part, the fact that you can interact more dynamically, which is simply the fact that you have more granular control over access uh, to your data. Essentially, you know, once data has been downloaded, somebody else will have it. Um, whereas with an API, you can cut off access to your information, in which case people can still have the information uh, that they've already extracted from the API, but at least they don't necessarily have the entire database um, behind it. Um, Obviously, if you want to have any kind of reasonable assurances behind it, people can also use your API to just you know, record by record, step by step, extract your entire database. If that's not what you want, and usually it isn't what you want, you might want to build in certain safeguards as well in terms of maximum um, use of resources, um, maximal concurrent uh, downloads, download speeds, volume transactions, number of transactions, however you want to break it down. But essentially, APIs um, are also useful from that perspective and that they allow you to maintain more fine, gra fine uh, granular control over your uh, database, which is also legally important because people often uh, worry about that in the open data context uh, and open licensing uh, context that you know, once you put data out there under an open license, your control is gone forever. 
with APIs, there are some ways that you can constrain it a little bit because you can um, more tightly limit the access to uh, the data itself. So that's basically the, the, the importance of APIs and how that can work. Um, so how do you actually do that in practice? What can you build around that? And what can we do for you? Because I imagine that quite a few people in uh, the webinar today also are interested in that, looking at what we from the Support Center for Data Sharing actually can provide in terms of help or in terms of resources. Uh, there are two things, two major things that I want to draw uh, attention on. First is a very simple one. Uh, we do actually have a help desk uh, at the Support Center for Data Sharing where you can uh, basically submit uh, support requests. So if you're struggling with something in um, particular, if you have a question that you would like us to look into or would provide guidance on, you can contact us uh, through the support form. Um, you can ask general questions. You can contact us with technical issues also on how APIs need to be implemented or if there are any relevant standards or formats that you need to take into account. Or as I've highlighted here, because this is a legal session for uh, legal issues, um, for the avoidance of doubt, the support center is not your private law firm. So uh, it's not good news in the sense that you are allowed to um, fire your lawyer and rely 100% on the support that you will get from the support center. Um, but we will do our best with any kind of support request that we get to provide you with helpful guidance with some additional resources that you might need to um, put you on the right track. So you have the URL at the top of the screen there. Uh, and uh, an overview of what that looks like. So if you do have specific questions, uh, not just general, well, also general policy questions, but also something particular about um, legal issues stopping you from uh, sharing your data with somebody who you think should be sharing their data with you but isn't, um, you can get in touch with us and we will uh, look at uh, the issue for you. So that's the help desk itself. The other th bigger thing that is coming up that we're working on right now is the uh, Support Center for Data Sharing uh, API Licensing um, Assistant. This is actually a much more targeted, um, uh, much more tightly focused uh, service that we want to provide and will start providing uh, as of the end of the month via the um, Support Center. It's the very basic, uh, it aims to address the very basic question that um, if you want to make data available, in this case particularly through an API, you probably want to impose certain terms and conditions, uh, certain contractual terms, a license essentially, um, in relation to the use of your service. Um, if you're looking for a good starting point, a good template, uh, you can definitely uh, just look on the internet, find a comparable company to you, uh, copy paste that and um, make the necessary minimal modifications for your service. Or you can obviously go to um, a, a lawyer or legal support organization and ask them to produce something for you. Um, if you're just recycling existing templates, however, it's a little bit risky because you don't know, you know, is this really suitable for an API? Is it tailored towards the issue that's, that I just mentioned, that I just explained? Um, is it focused on a European context? I talked already about public sector information and about personal data. Those are very, um, well, not uniquely, but they are originally European concerns, which other countries don't necessarily have or don't necessarily have to the same extent. Or they don't deal with it to the same extent. So um, whether uh, other templates are useful for European context um, is a little bit uncertain. And then the question of whether it's actually suitable for you, whether it's tailored to your own needs, to your own uh, business model, your own expectations and your own sensitivities. So that's um, downloading something from the internet is always an option, not necessarily the best option. To try to, um, remedy that situation to some extent. We're building uh, right now the API licensing assistant, which is basically an online tool that will be available on the support center website where uh, you will be asked about a dozen questions around five topics areas, um, largely uh, yes or no or radio box options where you have to indicate which um, element applies to you. And on the basis of that, a license text will be generated for you that's tailored to the specific um, answers that you've um, provided. Um, it will not be, certainly at the initial versions, it will not be something that allows you to um, switch your brain off entirely in the sense that you can copy paste the outcome without any kind of critical reflection, but it will provide a uh, workable license text that uh, allows you to cut quite a lot of corners and that hopefully will help uh, even you know, with not non-legal backgrounds uh, to create something that's relatively well suited for their own um, purposes. 
So um, what are the uh, topic areas and what are the questions that we'll be looking into? First of all, we'll be asking some questions about the content or nature of the data, whether it's personal data or public sector information. We'll provide some guidance, some explanations as well, because we are very much aware that some of those words don't mean anything to many people. Um, we'll ask you about whether you want to charge for the data, whether how long people are allowed to use their data after they've extracted it from the API. We'll uh, ask some questions about uh, intellectual property rights and uh, reuse rights, permissions for the um, end users. So you know, whether they can create derivative um, databases uh, integrated in applications for commercial, non-commercial purposes, whether they can use the data for um, AI training analytics, called computational use here, or scientific research. And then the more um, uh, intuitively recognizable ones, probably in relation to what legislation should apply to your license and what happens in case of a um, conflict. So which country has uh, jurisdiction? We also add questions there about whether you want to offer any kind of assurances um, on uh, the availability of your service in terms of um, service level agreements, in terms of availability, throughput, and so forth. So um, that is what we'll be presenting. Like I said, about a dozen uh, questions in total. Um, is it going to be perfect? Um, there I want to do some expectation management. It's not, you know, uh, unfortunately there are more than 12 issues to consider when creating these licenses. So we're not going to kid you into saying that this will definitely um, allow you to comprehensively cover any question that might um, come up. So it doesn't um, cover any all possible eventualities, uh, all possible nuances. Um, we also, and that's unfortunately also something that we have to stress, it doesn't come with a guarantee of suitability for your use case. So you know, we, it's, it's going to be obviously a free tool. You can uh, use it as you like, um, but we do not provide legal assurances that this is definitely going to be uh, appropriate for you. You will still need to review it in the end and uh, your use of the, the generated text remains yours. So that's uh, sort of the, the, I'd say the, the counterpart of the fact that it's a tool that you can use available um, for free. Um, it is, however, useful uh, to quick start, and it's important to note also that uh, for the clauses that we'll be producing in there, we've not tried to reinvent the wheel. We've tried to uh, call wherever possible on existing templates, on additional, on an existing model licenses, um, both from private organizations and from public administrations, to make sure that um, it's aligned pretty well with existing market practices and that it establishes um, a healthy baseline. Um, a credible baseline that's likely to be appropriate for your use case. The examples that I mentioned here are as, as topics where we've tried to just basically follow the market. Um, examples are data quality and liability. Um, essentially, any template that you can find um, will uh, disclaim any kind of liability, just right off the bat, any data that you get through the API, um, no guarantee of fitness for use um, or uh, appropriateness for your particular use case or of data quality it is provided as is. Every template works like that. Um, same thing for data quality. The data that you get is the data that's available. No guarantees behind that. We have considered sort of um, trying to roll that back a little bit and also ask questions on that allow you to um, establish specific liability caps or to offer certain guarantees. The issue is that there seems to be, um, at least in the template markets, very uh, little demand for that. The reason is also because if you're moving towards a more commercial model, it's more likely that you have specific expertise, specific consultancy available for you to establish what is acceptable as a legal baseline. So it is uh, built on best practices. It's not something that's um, you know entirely academic without any link to reality. Um, it's not available yet. If you look at the website right now, you're not find anything about the API licensing assistance. The goal is, however, that we can go live with that by the end of this month. Um, if you have specific inputs or specific concerns, for instance, in terms of licenses that you think we need to look at because they do something similar, uh, that's very welcome. If you feel that there are additional topics that you need that we need to cover or additional questions beyond the ones uh, that were on the previous slide, that's also very welcome. We um, also expect that this is something that will be maintained and refined still over uh, the coming year or so. So this is not something you know it's, uh, where you on the 1st of June can go to the website, generate a license, and that's all there will ever be. Uh, we will continue to improve that based on the feedback that we get, based on the suggestions that we get, and based on our own experience with the tool. So we do hope to uh, refine that a little bit further still 
in uh, the uh, coming months. Um, if you say that's very nice, but I need to do something next week, so I cannot wait until the beginning of June, uh, I need to have more information right now. You probably might already be aware of the fact that we have a lot of information already available on our website, uh, on uh, the Sports Center website, including uh, API guidance, technical guidance on um, how APIs uh, are expected to function and how they're supposed to be implemented. And the legal deliverables that I mentioned, legal reports that I mentioned earlier on already, um, including a collection of model contract terms, which is a bundle of contractual terms that um, are already being used in practice to share data between one organization and the next, some of which are very specific, for instance, sharing, in, uh, sharing of medical data, sharing financial data, or sharing for AI purposes, AI analytics. Others are very generic and um, basically um, allow you to share any kind of data for any kind of use. So that already is an interesting repository if you just want to copy paste something right now. Um, and then finally, as I also mentioned, we already have a report available uh, on EU legislation that's applicable to the sharing of non-personal data, which you can also download right now. It's a, a hefty document. I think it's, it's close to 100 pages with uh, summaries of uh, European legislation. But in most cases, for most of you, uh, there probably isn't an overriding need to read the entire document, uh, but rather you can pick out the uh, bits and pieces of legislation that are relevant to you, to your industry, or to your uh, use case. So we do already have um, a lot of information available for you um, if you have any kind of immediate um, information needs or information requirements. And that's basically what we wanted to present to you uh, in terms of you know, the overview of the current context, uh, the main legal issues, and especially just as a preview for uh, upcoming work or upcoming activities. So um, with that, I think it's a good time for me to um, open the floor and to see if there are any uh, questions, any other issues that you would like to raise or suggestions you would like to make. Oh, the floor is yours. Um, I, I can uh, start with the first question, Hans. Uh, so what, um, being a legal expert, what do you think about uh, RecTech? Uh, I, I know that also a couple of fintech companies are here. So I know that fintech companies now also collaborate with RecTech and that you see a lot of, um, you know, combination of legal issues with, that are also being dealt with by technology. Um, it's a very good initiative because it's, um, it's an industry that suffers from a combination uh, of issues, uh, which it's, it's never going to be very helpful as an answer, but the challenge that FinTech companies have mainly is that um, they are working in a very volatile market in the sense that the role of banks and banking institutions is changing very rapidly. Um, they've, you know, gone from a single point of contact for financial services and for the financial industry to basically being pushed towards a resource provider role with an entire ecosystem of fintech companies revolving around that. In order to do that, they need access to the data, to your financial information. With PSD2, we now have a legal framework that um, mandates that kind of information sharing under specific constraints in specific context. But um, banking institutions occasionally are still quite reluctant to work with that because for them, uh, the financial information that they have is the crown jewel. So it's difficult for them to open that up. In addition, uh, I don't think there's any way to dance around that. The legislation is also difficult to interpret and apply in specific contexts. I think that the general um, objectives of um, the uh, regulations are relatively clear. However, the way that it actually has to be interpreted in practice and what kind of uh, constraints, technical, operational, security-wise, what kind of constraints are justifiable um, is uh, still essentially up for interpretation. Uh, banks occasionally um, have the tendency to interpret those a little bit too constrictively because it is also important for them as a way to make sure their customers um, retain those banks as a, as a primary point of contact. And as an additional complicating factor, uh, people's readiness, citizens' readiness to adopt the openness of the financial model is, um, varies a lot from country to country and even from individual to individual. 
um, just ask your own family and your own circle of friends about who is um, willing to have their uh, financial information approached by a fintech company. Some will be very interested in doing that. Uh, some will not be interested in doing that at all. So the, the boring answer on that is that it's um, an, uh, an industry that's still very much in flux, uh, still very much um, looking for a new balance, a new um, equilibrium on how that market will work. And I think you know, any new initiative that aims to um, try and resolve those issues and to provide a broader consensus across the market, or at least a big segment of the market, um, for opening up that information and for allowing new value to be created, I think is very useful simply as a way for um, establishing that equilibrium and establishing that balance a little bit more quickly. So I think that's in a nutshell where, where it comes from. I think you know, in terms of, of legal, um, legal complexities, the main impact that you can expect is that you get a broader consensus in the market of what the legislation actually means and how it impacts the different stakeholders. The complexities, however, will remain um, until, you know, until there is a bigger consensus in the market about what's actually supposed to happen and where it's supposed to go to. Thank you. Are there any other questions or observations or suggestions? Like I said, it's um, either during this session or afterwards, we'd very much welcome um, suggestions on where we need to take the work. Um, what we're doing right now uh, for the licensing assistant is pretty new. Um, we've basically done some market research. We found only one comparable initiative in Canada. But apart from that, I think what we're trying to do with the uh, question answers model for license generation is pretty new. So any suggestions that you have um, for making it more useful for the market would be very welcome, of course. At this stage, I welcome people to jump in. And if they cannot, uh, the chat room is open, uh, as you can see. And they're also welcome to have their input there. Uh, another question I have that also links to when we were discussing expectations at the beginning of the call, I suppose, is how do you see this work on a larger scale contributing to the EU single market and the digital framework? Well, I think the, the it's actually an interesting one. And also, it's it's good that you remind me because there's a, a also a question about the role of portals that I kind of jumped over because it was a little bit complicated to uh, look at um, during the session itself. Um, it's interesting because a lot of new things are being tested right now. So the work that we're doing with uh, the support center is going to be quite useful, I hope, for the individual organization that's decided that they want to share data, that they um, are pretty sure there are no legal constraints for doing that, and they just want to help have some guidance on the modalities for doing that. Um, that's a very targeted uh, use case and a, a very targeted demographic, which is good. I think it's great that we're going to be helping them. Beyond that, however, uh, there are also going to be a lot of um, ancillary related policy initiatives, um, some legal initiatives, some also non-legislative uh, in terms of, of best practices, in terms of, of guidelines um, on how um, data sharing should occur and in which contexts. Um, I do think that we will see the emergence of new legislation um, for uh, business to government data sharing. So basically the mirror image of what we have in terms of uh, PSI legislation, where data flows generally from the public sector to the government. I think we'll see the reverse happening as well. And I think you will see um, the emergence of you know, what they call in European policy, uh, the emergence of data spaces, where you essentially allow communities to get easier access to larger repositories um, of data. Um, this, I think, will raise for some the specter of, of um, large and very expensive data platforms that essentially hold all the data where you have to pay a large amount of money or you're excluded from the market. Um, but I do think it's important to underline that that's not the only outcome of these kinds of initiatives and, and hopefully it will not be the, the, the primary one. I know that, uh, and everybody knows that, because that's, I think, you know, the news talks about one thing and one thing only, which is uh, the corona pandemic right now. And a lot of member states, a lot of governments right now are looking into how they can uh, more effectively make medical information available 
um, to medical researchers, certainly in academia, but potentially also in private industries, pharmaceutical industries, because this is a clear case where, um, first of all, the context is relatively comparable, the need for safeguards is com clearly comparable, and where you have a clear uh, public policy benefit in terms of creating um, uh, new treatments, new medical um, alternatives. So you see that in medical context, but you have the same thing in terms of um, logistics in terms of environmental protections where there is this greater awareness that data needs to be made available in some cases um, to uh, any interested stakeholders in some cases the very uh, well identified demographics like medical researchers or um, scientific uh, research communities and so forth so i do think that we will see sort of this mix uh, on the one hand between entities that um, make their own data available without any kind of intermediary, without any kind of data platform in between. And also a um, broader ecosystem of um, what might be data markets or data repositories or um, data warehouses, data lakes, where data can be um, brought together and made available to more specific uh, reuser groups for more specifically defined purposes. It's still very early to say which direction that that market will go into. Um, like I said, we only, uh, with the API licensing assistant, we only um, try to solve the problem for one very specific small group. There will be a lot more happening outside of that. Um, but I think the, the, the horizontal trend, and that's the important one, the big thing to keep in mind, is that the increasing awareness that um, it is not healthy for consumers or for the European markets, that a very small group um, of uh, organizations or entities can monopolize data. That's not the best way to make progress as a society. And um, if there is not enough spontaneous development towards data sharing, then European policy will start nudging and or forcing towards data sharing. I think that's the horizontal tre trend. And I think even organizations that currently have a very dominant market positions are aware that um, they need to prepare for broader uh, competition. I think that's sort of the, the bigger trend that everybody is keeping an eye out for and where we also try to, uh, to play our role as a support center. Okay, thank you for the uh, detailed response. I'm still opening the floor to everyone and also being mindful of the time because we're also reaching the end of the allocated time for the webinar. Um, so I also then asked to Hunt, do you have time for a bit of, if people want to stay a bit longer to have a chat and to discuss, or are you fixed for three o'clock? I have a couple more minutes. I can go a little bit over time if, uh, if necessary. Okay. If uh, no one has any additional questions than I do have, oh, I hear someone unmuting. And then I do have an additional question, and that's um, so we you discussed that this is still quite new. You only you've only seen that Canada has also done something similar to this, the, and right now it's focusing more on a very specific scope. How do you see this evolving? Not just looking at the sports center for data sharing, but also seeing how this can grow within the EU market and potentially on a wider scale. I think there's definitely a lot of potential because I think, um, you know, in, in those broader and more organized communities where data is being made available on a common basis to more or less homogeneous uh, constituency, they also will have the need for um, sort of a baseline for terms and conditions for legal terms that they want to apply to their members. Um, like I said, we're always a little bit careful to not... Um, present the support center initiatives and to present the uh, European data policy as being synonymous with open data in the literal sense of, you know, make it available for free use to everybody. Because there are many cases, many um, use cases where there are valid reasons to impose certain constraints. I think um, what our API licensing assistant will allow you to do is uh, to generate um, a basic text that's reasonably well balanced in the sense that it will um, be able to integrate some of your concerns, some of your priorities. And I think that that will be a useful tool, a useful input that can be used for those more targeted um, initiatives um, as well. So uh, I think uh, to simplify that a little bit, I think the model texts that we will be able to generate with our licensing assistant will be useful as well in um, other more specific uh, contexts where they can say, okay, 
let's start off with the work that the support center did and then create something that's a little bit more specific to our needs for medical community, uh, a logistics community, a, a smart city uh, platform, anything you can think of, environmental, uh, citizen science, all of those kinds of initiatives where you might say the core issues are the same, but the requirements and the constraints that we impose um, are slightly particular uh, in our use case. And there you can take our work as a baseline and modify it, build on it. Very open data-like, in fact, that approach. Exactly. Yeah, I'm excited to see with that. But I think it's also good to conclude um, the Q&A with participants and everyone listening in also via this um, webinar itself and also on YouTube to feel free to email Hans, um, as you can see his email address over here, or to contact us at the Support Center for Data Sharing, either via the, the help desk form that Hans also showed earlier, or via contacting us at info at eudatasharing.eu. The modular license that Hans has been describing will soon be made available on the website. And we look forward to continue collaborating with you as the data sharing community. That is it. Absolutely. Time. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you all for the attention. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.